Hello, we're here. Thank you so much. Opposition? Here. Thank you. Uh, while I roll call the panelists, uh, feel free to input your speaker orders in the chat so that we can key in the ballot. Uh, Daniel, are you here? Hi. Thank you. Johan? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Toby? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And Rita Bata? Yep. All right, great. Thanks so much. So this is a brief round of introductions. My name is Shireen. I'll be your chair for the final. Looking forward to an excellent debate. Um, if my panelists would like to introduce themselves briefly in the order they appear on the tabs, that'd be great as well. Hi, uh, Daniel Tatum. Um, hi, I'm Johan. Any pronouns are fine. Uh, Toby? Um, hello, everyone. Congratulations for making it to the finals. My name is Toby. I have my preferred gender pronouns. All the best to the folks. Care, care. Um, Rita, Rita, here, hear him. All right, great. Thanks so much. So, just confirming that we're doing the motion on the South prefers a world in which wealthy individuals with guaranteed financial security do not seek employment. So um, I'll do my best to input timestamps in the chat at 1, 6, and 7, but also please do time your own speeches in case I lose track. Uh, at the top of your speeches, again, just remind everyone in the room how you prefer to receive your eyes, be it verbally or in the chat, just so that everyone's aware of their preference. Without further ado, I invite the Prime Minister to open the debate. Here, here. Uh, just checking if you can hear me. Loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Hans, preferred pronouns are he, him, they, and I prefer if the POIs are done through camera and you can just wave, but if I don't see it, you can also spam in the chat. Before I begin, just like to shout out the debate community. I've been out of debate for a couple of years, but it's nice to be back with like a bunch of like friendly people. Um, so really enjoying the experience and shout out to Ateneo Debate Society, the one that got away. Shout out to Lenny Robredo, uh, go win for the Philippines. All right, so I'm going to start my speech now. All right, three, two, one. Let's start by defining what we mean by wealthy. We're talking about people who are wealthy because of their inheritance or people who had initial capital to be able to invest and build businesses. We think this definition comprises the vast majority of the economic elite across the world. Capital that was built on generations such that it is enough for someone not to worry for another day in their life. What we mean by guaranteed security is that these people will not have to worry about earning anymore. They have a secure degree of comfort that is likely to be more decent than the average person, even if they did not have employment income. Just want to preempt a couple of things. Uh, op is likely to say wealthy individuals are likely to continue being extractive by doing things like investing or buying up companies. We think that on the whole, that's a good thing because investing connects people who otherwise would have had idle wealth to people who need it, meaning that corporations whose stocks are bought are more likely to expand and hire more people. The economy becomes more stable when firms have more wealth in reserve, and there's more research and development that benefits the whole of society. We think that the wealthy in our world have more incentive to grow their money for productive means instead of spending it on productive, unproductive things like islands, designer bags, things that will get old. I have three arguments. And my first argument is freeing up labor and employment benefits for a lot of people. We think this world is one where the top level executive positions are likely going to be affected. What do these positions look like? Two things. Number one, note that these are often the kinds of positions with ridiculously high salaries compared to majority of existing positions in companies, given that the rich exert their influence through their position, even if it does not optimally match the pricing of the market. Number two, these are also the positions that are more often than not provide little to no value because they are designed to be extractive. Typically, workers produce you know, the surplus value that gets all gobbled up, leading to widened economic inequality in the long run. What is our world where people don't like wealthy people don't seek employment likely to lead to positions will still exist we think those top level positions will still happen but likely will be reduced if bloated or their salaries will be significantly lowered to match the market we think this has a bunch of benefits number one this frees up the unlocked finances to move downwards across the company we think this is likely to lead to things like more employment benefits more funding for things like higher salaries for lower positions because you can no longer use the excuse that we don't have the budget because all of it is going to the top level salaries number two we think that this can also allow companies 
companies with more funding to expand their business and employ more people in the long run because you no longer have to spend a large part of your profit and your budget on ridiculous salaries that don't really have a return on investment in terms of the value they provide. Now let's talk about the people that are going to be able to move up the company ladder once these wealthy people are gone. We are talking about a character that is likely to come from a marginalized group that has been systemically excluded from wealth even if they are competent and willing. We are talking about racial groups that have historically migrated from other places left with little to no generational wealth. We're talking about women who more often lose out on things like inheritance and personal assets that favor men amongst families because the perception is that men can handle finances better. We think this is likely to produce an overall more moral business executive, right? What happens when you can no longer rely on your wealth or connections? You have to curry favor within the company. You have to build favor amongst peers in the company instead. Gather large support within the firm by promising to change like stupid like company policies that just hurt people. You can no longer on rely on your wealth to rise to the stop top. And we think that this incentive system forces even the selfish to be altruistic in order to secure those positions. Second argument, being wealthy leads to exercising structurally unproductive and invaluable labor. Let's characterize the wealthy. First, nepotism, where family ties often open the door for you to immediately enter higher positions in a firm without earning it. Number two, things like, for example, credentials, perceived higher quality education, and like Ivy League or prestigious universities in the country where even if you end up having bad grades or no extracurricular experience, you're still going to be fine. Even if you have past histories like of being abusive or doing crime, like driving under the influence, you're able to whitewash that record because of high position connections in the government. Number three, people who are wealthy are likely to not be aware of the situation of the average person especially in their company. And we think this is what often leads to existing policies that are obviously humane. Think of cases like, for example, Amazon fulfillment factories where you're not allowed to pee, right, regularly. Or Foxconn manufacturing in China, which leads people to, like, jump out of the buildings and they have to install safety nets, right? Further, we think even if these rich people are aware of the situation, they have a perverse incentive to take hold of top level executive positions in order to preserve their private interests, crack down on unions, and in some cases, even influence government policy. Why do we think this is bad for meritocracy? We think very wealthy individuals can succeed despite incredible mediocrity. Nepotism and their families' connections within companies being legacies or having access to prep and interview institutions to get into higher level schools, having a name and reputation simply because you're the one of someone like coming from wealthy family. We think these candidates on paper seem more competent, but they are not. They can justify that they'll know all the family secrets to the company and that it needs continuity. They can say they have this degree that proves they're smart and competent. We think these people are in positions that make life-changing decisions for many people, and this is a risk that we're not willing to take. On our side, we have a process where most competent individuals are likely to be chosen rather than those who can buy their credentials or rely on personal connections. We're all going to end up making these like stupid decisions that are bad for the majority of people. Last argument, why is our world likely to produce a more altruistic elite? Often the currency of the rich and the elite in lots of countries is to tout their status through their occupation. Look at me, I'm the CEO, I'm a business owner. If you were to ask anyone what they do, their occupation is how they respond because this is how most people construct meaning in their lives. We concede that some are likely to continue living a hedonistic life, like maybe buying an island with their remaining wealth, but we think that there are many individuals who are going to end up searching for some meaning with what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Look. You, even the most hardworking CEOs are going to have their like nine to five at the very least freed up. What do you think they're going to do with that time? Like you can only buy so many margaritas or buy so many private islands. We think these people are likely to do some form of daily labor that's need to ensure they don't feel that they're not doing anything with their lives. We think these behaviors are likely, given the immense wealth that they have, likely going to be things like, for example, philanth like philanthropic uh, activities, volunteering, for example, or taking part in the development of local communities. Like... Obviously, this is not going to be the case for everyone, but we have lots of examples where even like rich people who have stayed in positions for long times end up doing philanthropic ideas, right? If we're characterizing wealthy individuals like self-interested, um, really egotistical, but we think that like combined with their wealth that they can do immense good because we think that this incentive structure gives them some semblance of like working towards a lasting legacy that they couldn't otherwise do through employment or through their position, even if they are self-interested. At the very least in our world, this kind of self-interest is not something that's extractive and putting people down, but it's something that benefits other people and ultimately, in many cases, close the wealth gap. For all these reasons and more, very, very proud to propose. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for that speech and would like to next invite the leader of opposition.
think you're muted. Test. Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. Um, may I check that I can be heard? Yep, loud and clear. You are muted. No, you, you're unmuted now, you're loud and clear. Testing, can I check that I can be heard? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Okay, sorry. Yeah, my sound was off just now, so I didn't hear anything. No worries. Thank you. Um, I'll be starting my speech in three, two, one. Generally, I think we prefer a world in which rich people are just useful and we kind of try to get some like marginal utility out of them. Um, I don't really think that like it's beneficial if they just sit around and do nothing. Like honestly, their money is not going to go anywhere except for like sit in their pockets. I think that that's just like generally problematic. So like, I'm just going to move on to my argument on why exactly wealthy people working actually has benefits to other individuals in society at large. So the first year of this argument is that wealthy people will still likely look to expand their wealth. And I think absent of employment, they achieve, the, they achieve this but via means of passive income like investment on the side of the government. So one, why are they likely going to be investing? I think first, rich people are likely going to be investing that money somewhere anyway, because growing wealth is always an intuitively good thing and no money is actually enough. On a secondary level, inflation always like just makes your money drop in value. I think they just naturally want to invest in things like fluid assets or real estate. I think second of all, it's just natural for them, right? Like if they have rich family backgrounds, they're likely like sons of CEOs, for instance, they likely have things like boutique investment firms under them where they ask them to like manage their portfolio, like stocks options, real estate and keep crypto so i think there's a lot of structural things that are, that are already in place managing their family's wealth this will ultimately this they will ultimately decide what they actually want to invest in i think crucially a lot of these things are going to happen regardless if they're employed or not sorry um when they're like unemployed i think working therefore the second tier of this is that working and seeking employment allows them to actually make more meaningful investments to actually help people because one i think employment allows them to under understand fundamental systems within corporations for instance i think this looks like things like financial and production chains within corporations i think second being able to tell the stock price direction of companies by doing market investment and reading up on like companies and knowing what exactly they ought to be looking out for and what is what are those markers and what do those markers mean for certain companies for instance i think three it looks like you having insider information of the market and of other corporations like for instance like no know, knowing how quantum computing can potentially make the semiconductor industry useless is a very important investment direction that you likely wouldn't know if you're not in that industry to begin with i think four it mean also means that you know the forecast of a certain type of inv investment and how exactly it's likely going to be performing on a fifth level i think it's also like knowing policy changes of the government and how the government signaling is going to be affecting the industry and your company, right? Because if you see your company take the hit or be, or be affected, I think it just generally means that you understand the implications of a lot of these things, which you otherwise will not if you're stuck in, like stuck at home, just investing in other things. On a second level, I think, therefore, they are able to invest in things that ultimately have a good impact on people. So the premise of this here is that things that are good investments are likely good things that propel the industry forward and benefit people, or they are likely going to be investing in like startups, for instance, right? Because investing in the right field means that you increase things like productivity within the market. I think um, if you invest in things like quantum computing and it takes off, it just means that there's the increased speed of cyber infrastructure and greater efficiency, you generate more jobs, etc. On a second level, I think that it, if it comes to things like startups, if you pitch a good startup to a venture capitalist, a venture capitalist that actually knows the needs of the market will likely invest in it. I think one that is out of touch with the market and doesn't really know much information will, will likely not invest in it, right? They are likely going to invest in things that other rich people also like. And I think crucially, only like only rich people have the capacity to actually invest in things like startups and be willing to actually take the risk because startups are relatively new. They don't really have a like track record. I think rich people are uniquely in a position to do this. And therefore, this is incredibly important important that we actually allow this to continue. So I think eventually you want wealthy people to find out what the world is like in order for them to be making wise investments to improve the lives of people on the ground, right? I think this also means that there are changes in economies and market structures that eventually trickle down to people. The comparative is that they invest in like very useless things and like they are inherently out of 
out of touch of market needs. And I think that, especially given the kind of government characterization of these corporations being, oh, sorry, of these individuals being so incredibly mediocre, I think they are likely going to be very like out of touch with what exactly the market needs. They are likely going to not, to not be able to see the potential within certain startups and certain ideas, for instance. I think on a third level, rich people working necessarily improves the working conditions for everyone else. This is like, say, like the immediate, like people within his immediate environment within the corporation as well. So the premise is just that rich people have nothing to lose because for people who are just there for employment, I think that's very likely that they don't really have the incentive to raise solutions to problems that are more effective, right? Because I think the comparative is that people notice problems within systems all the time, but they don't really raise them because one, I don't think that they get paid extra for it. And two, I think suggesting that the system is inefficient just likely means that you are saying that the company is bad. And I think that people are just generally very afraid of it. I think on a second level is that a lot of people just don't raise problems of this sexism because they are just unable to and because they don't want to risk their job. I think rich people are uniquely out of this because they have the safety nets of their wealth and they're like just they just are not afraid of being potentially retrenched. I think it means that like a lot of the problems that they raise are likely going to get solved, for instance. Also, definitely also because like when they raise problems, people more readily act on them. I think like it also mean, it just means that because you can't really offend rich people because rich people have connections and you want to appease them more. I think this also means that people within their immediate surroundings are more likely going to listen to what they have to say. I think thirdly, rich people are actually more likely willing to help others if they actually have employment, right? I think this ties into like things like contact theory. That is to say that individuals who don't look for employment likely wouldn't want to go to university to find a degree anyway because there's just no end outcome. It just means that they're likely going to be mingling with other rich people as well. And I think given how a huge part of an individual's life is actually gainful employment, in the lack thereof or the absence of it, I think it just means that you just waste a lot of your free time mingling with people like of the same social strata. I think as of status quo, some of them actually care about being philanthropic to some nominal degree, right? Partly because they are actually employed, because they talk to people who have different circumstances and they actually understand what are the structural issues that people face. For instance, like things like that, like student debt. I think on government, they told us that even if like these people aren't going to be working, they're likely going to be philanthropic. I think this is an assumption that people likely want to be creating meaning in their life is, is one of status quo, right? I think in the world of the government, this likely wouldn't exist and they don't really get, a, get this benefit because it's inherent within the motion. On a secondary level, I don't think that they're likely going to be philanthropic because they just fundamentally cannot relate to the kinds of needs that people might face. And as a result, they just won't feel the need to actually donate. And at the point at which they have zero capacity to understand, much less the money is actually going to be tr trickling down, for instance. And I think that they are likely going to be entrenching their power by doing problematic things like running for politics, for instance. Um, I think going to university also means that you are exposed to more liberal viewpoints. So I think that's a plus one because otherwise you'll be hanging out with your like rich conservative white dad. On a last level, I think employment prevents people from using their resources in exploitative ways, right? At a point at which you have no jobs and financial income, it means that you squeeze money out in order to do things like predatory lending and you take people from people, uh, take money from people. I think it also, at the point at which you talk to people and you understand the structural issues that they face, I think you're less likely to do things like convert the current buildings that you're renting out into a, like, a condominium and force the middle class families within them to either pay a down payment to buy the house or kick them out, right? I, because you understand that they can't pay the down payment and you can't do these things to them. I think it also means that you open yourself up to people who are able to criticize you. So for all of these reasons, so proud to oppose. Thank you, Leader of Opposition, for that speech. And I'd like to next invite the Deputy Prime Minister. start my speech in three, two, one. Uh, many things. First, I want to talk about investment because they say that if you are investing your wealth in things that are good and productive, that is better. What I want to note is they don't explain why their investments are any better than ours. What I'd like to note about our investments is that when this is the only wealth that you can hold on to, you are not likely to invest in the stupid things they say because that is a waste of money. You are potentially jeopardizing your children. You are jeopardizing yourself in 40, 50, 60 years. And therefore, the best investments to make are ones that are going to be sustainable in the long term, 
ones that are likely to grow and become productive. And we know these are possibly quite good investments. There's no, like, it's valuable to invest in the stock market, right? These are companies that need capital in order to do things like expand their company and further it, ensure they are more stable in times of economic crisis, do research and development, or ensure that they don't have to downsize and lay off multiple workers. So these investments are more likely to occur if you know that this money is valuable and you need it to increase in value versus on their side, where you have an alternative stream of still a lot of money, you don't really care about the pool of money that you have, and therefore you invest in things that don't have to go in value. Designer bags, jewelry, luxury goods are the same hedonistic trends that they say they would opt into. In fact, what I'd argue is it's a lot easier to fall into this hedonistic trap insofar as you are over, you feel like you're overworked. Obviously, you're not going to be. You feel like you're overworked on a day-to-day basis. You need a break. You deserve to reward yourself, but you can opt into these different things. What we note on our side is that when people, especially the wealthy, lose that semblance of meaning and feel like they have no way to contribute to greater society on a day-to-day level, That used to be their job because they thought they were increasing productivity. They thought they could build an empire. They thought they could establish whatever business, get rewards for it. What we were claiming is that oftentimes good behavior, volunteer work, or doing some kind of contribution to your community are things that are socially reinforced, ones that you are rewarded for, but are unlikely to pursue in the instance the more lucrative option of a corporate job is available. Secondly, they say you'll provide more additional labor to society. At least you're not useless, right? One, This assumes that more supply is always good, when obviously that isn't always the case. When you have more supply, but you're not changing the demand, what I would say is a job that is highly competitive and didn't need more applicants to become CEO. One, this crowds out other people that we explained were probably better candidates. I think it's a better world where people can work hard and feel like their hard work pays off because daddy's son is not going to get the job for any reason at all. But secondly, that this is likely to be a more represented group, precisely because generational wealth and inheritance likely favors white males who are probably not deserving of such generational wealth. But secondly, I think we think that this is a negative replacement, i.e. if someone else had done this job, they probably would have done all the same things off dots. They would have learned the systems, they would have had to, they would have had to ensure that they know what they're doing, they would have had to study probably even harder and work even harder than this wealthy person has. But the unique difference we have is the incentive, i.e. if you have no name to yourself, there's no reason people should trust you, there's no reason the company should have faith in you, the need for you to curry favor around the people like around you, Promise things like perhaps popularity among the workers by being able to increase employment benefits, popularity among middle management by ensuring you're not overworking every single white collar worker in your building ensures that these incentives, because you can't rely on the fact that you're someone's son, you can't rely on the fact that you have an Ivy League degree, means that you're probably more likely to like, uh, engage in behaviors that are positive. Lastly, I just say having wealthy people who are well connected is often negative in the presence of a market. And that's because if you have access to such large degrees of generational wealth, things like regulation that you can lobby in your favor are likely to be bad for the society as a whole. Things like the access to connections means that when, for example, there is a bidding war for a public infrastructure project or you want to buy stock, access to things like proprietary information, access to things like insider trading, which is very hard to be able to regulate against, access to things like just knowing, being able to go and fancy dinners, knowing that this is your friend that you grew up with, and therefore they should be able to favor you in this bidding process, makes the ability to make the best decisions for a large number of people harder. And note that having a more competent leader isn't just good because it's fair. It's good because when a business goes under, people are going to lose work. Products are going to get more expensive. And having people who have survived on the basis of their family name making such important decisions is not a good economy to work in. Next, they say, we'll improve working conditions. The first thing I want to note is the comparative. Again, if you have an antagonistic relationship, i.e. you don't need the favor of the people in this area to bring you to power, but you are fighting for the same pool of revenue and wages and salaries, you're probably not going to ensure better benefits for the people below you. But secondly, that these likely are people who come from backgrounds that are going to be less understanding. So if you have a white male that probably is the main beneficiary of this kind of generational wealth, they're probably less understanding of female employees, of like immigrant employees, and therefore are not likely to give them better labor conditions. But there are two more reasons that I would say are better for us. The first is their argument on contact theory is like flawed for a couple of reasons. The first is that it's limited. It's not like the CEO goes to all the factories. Maybe they do that for like a TV special, but it's not like they actually do the work and see people who are making their products. They're probably actually people in a far off Asian nation making their products instead. But secondly, is that 
Oftentimes, these relationships are antagonistic, right? Like rich people think, ah, oh, these workers, they're unionizing against me. They're trying to do all these things to bring the company down. Rather, I would say the people who would have come into power on our side of the house are ones that probably interacted with these people, maybe were them themselves, or no people that were in blue collar work, were not as well off, had engaged with them in their public schools, had engaged with them because they're family friends, and therefore were more likely to make decisions on this contact theory basis, versus them thinking that for some reason the CEO meets with all the workers in the like bottom line. Uh, I'll take the POI now. Um, so in, a, in status quo, the reason why people find employment even when they're financially secure is because there is that desire to create an identity that makes them feel occupied. But in your world, what do you think the reason is that they aren't seeking employment? Uh, so I want to note that this is by fiat, the world that we are creating. But secondly, that we think all the alternative methods of being able to create some kind of meaning are far better than existing in a corporate system where you might be able to profit and provide benefit to yourself. Lastly, we think this wealth will not last for like ever, right? At some point, some generation is not going to be able to keep that. What I'd argue about that is when you don't give the extremely wealthy a large amount of wealth that they can rely on plus the salaries, it is much easier to ensure you close the wealth gap. Even if this doesn't go to anyone else, and this is presuming there is no redistribution when we explain that investment to some extent benefits other people, assuming no redistribution, I would say the imbalance of power that is created by a wealthy and elite class that has such a disproportionate amount of wealth in comparison to the rest of the population ensures that they have a heavy hand in politics, ensures that they have a heavy hand in economic decisions, in the decisions made on a day-to-day -day basis, but also on a macro scale, that makes it impossible to check this class. Over time, I think we are more likely to see this wealth gap closing when they are not likely to get any kind of additional revenue for the wealth they already have. I'm very proud to propose. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for that speech and I'd like to next invite the Deputy Leader of Opposition. Um, sorry, just give me like a minute and a half. I'm going to run very quickly to the washroom and come back, sorry. Hi, sorry about that. Um, okay. Okay, uh, starting my speech in three, two, one. I want to start off by first doing a little bit of like, uh, you know, that, that dreaded meta debating catchword shit. Because I think that when we talk about preferring a world, we need to also be cognizant of the fact that this world requires us to make certain predictions or educated guesses about what it is like, um, which is why I asked that POI. And I think it's actually crucial because in Nico's speech, he claims that uh, this world, it just exists by fear that they don't look for employment, which I agree is fair. But I think it also suggests that we need to make educated guesses about what exactly is different about this world, such that um, such that it is one in which, uh, sorry, such that it is one in which these people no longer choose to find employment. And then I think we can see certain stark and unique differences that are actually crucial with the world that we currently live in. The first thing to note is, I think that to the extent to which individuals care about identity, care about being a useful member of society, and care about not being seen as a complete waste of space and oxygen, then I think in, those, in that world, that's the world that we exist in right now, which is why even extremely rich people who don't have to see it as a form of prestige and a form of justification of their own existence, to go to good colleges, and to get good jobs and to be seen as someone who is in a high powered career that proves their own capacity to like you know justify the space they're taking up on this earth that concept of identity and meaning is something that uniquely only exists currently in our world in their world yes they can fear that individuals will not want to find employment if they have financial security but i think that the educated guess we can therefore make about this that world is that among the rich at least or among individuals in general no one dreams of labor which is to say that the only people who want to have an occupation and want to have something that takes up their time 
are individuals who have to as a result of economic necessity because the richer people therefore have no unique desire to do anything to be a part of like a greater organization or to do anything but that hedonistic lifestyle and that is the reason why none of them seek employment i, I agree that they say you know uh, you know, then like look, that's why the stuff that they say about how like one side is more likely to lead to hedonistic lifestyles than the other is actually factually incorrect. Because to the extent to which you're not banning these people, you're preferring a world in which these things were true, then we have to also acknowledge that the premises that result in that in that particular outcome are premises that suggest that the inherent social narrative or the inherent human desire to be useful does not exist. We get the other rich kids that still exist in our world today, like the trust fund babies who really are just a waste of space and don't really do anything productive, they're just going to be all of the rich people that exist out there in the world. The second thing that I want to talk about then is how exactly does this affect the way that our society is structured? And I think that it's actually, it actually goes a lot deeper than what they claim to be. Obviously, the most I like the most in, the most intuitive outcomes that exist in their world is to say, ah, but now you know we free up CEOs and executive positions and MD positions to daddy son that didn't actually deserve to get to those positions. And as much as I hate daddy son, as much as the next person, I think that we need to realize that there are far greater implications than that. And the reason for that is because at the point at which none of these rich people um who own the most amount of capital is society or at least significant capital in society to the extent to which they no longer have to work are not in the workplace this drastically changes the way their society is structured because if you don't look for employment you are very unlikely to want to go into universities you're unlikely to stay in the gentrified corners of the world in which the middle class grow you are unlikely to ever interact with them in co-curricular activities or any social activities which is to say the rich people literally silo themselves away from any of the other kinds of interactions that they have with the middle class that we take for granted today and that is why we think is hugely impactful in the way that we must conceptualize of how capital is now going to be constructed. And I think this is implications for their wealth gap argument as well. Let's go through this one by one. Firstly, let's talk about how life is going to be like within the company for middle income individuals who want to seek employment. Because I think that was one of their biggest and clearest benefits. They say now with fewer rich people, we have more middle income people who can ascend to the rank of an executive or in the removal of that position of executive, the money that the executive gets moves downwards so more people can be hired. The first thing to suggest is I don't think executives are necessarily that useless, but to the extent to which they may not necessarily be the most useful people, the creation of those jobs are actually immensely important for those middle class individuals that can eventually ascend the ranks that allow them that kind of life-changing money that they talk about. But secondly, I just think that it's untrue that the money is going to go downwards. So if these are entirely fake positions and these people are actually literally sitting around and just replying five emails a day and pretending that they are working, then that money is just going to go back to the shareholders who are the exact same individuals who have the extractive power required to set those company policies in the first place. There is no actual change to individuals with regards to the amount of money they're, they're likely to earn and the amount of jobs they're likely to get. But actually, if you actually have a rich person, for example, who's working with you, they might be more cognizant of the fact that their department, for instance, requires people more human beings and more manpower. And that's why they might be more likely to hire more individuals and change company policies that way. Individuals, for example, who believe they have to work their way up in order to really earn their spot in the company that they are in, or who don't want to work for their family's company because they recognize that to be seen as nepotistic, and they care about the prestige associated of like making it on their own. Obviously, they didn't, but they care about that particular perception that they might necessarily have. Those people are likely going to work in other companies in which they are the ones who are most affected by things like HR policies as well. And because they don't have as much to lose, they are far more likely to raise these things up using the connections that you are talking about to actually create some measure of positive change for the people on the ground. We agree, by the way, we are not defending the idea that all wealthy people are great. But the point here is about a comparative. And relatively speaking, our side has more people who are likely to do these things than not. You are also talking about things like, for example, hoarding things like stock options. Currently, because they you know, have a position in the company, they know what's going on, etc. They are far more likely to have to be okay with things like, for example, providing stock options to the people on the ground because they recognize that these are things that lift up morale and make people far more motivated to work. At a point in which the interaction does not exist at all, things like stock options that enable individuals to have things like passive income and it's incredibly important for the middle class to be able to retire later on in life will not exist because they are seen as chipping away um, the rich person's ability to be able to maintain that lifestyle of absolute uselessness for the rest of their life. I think their life in the company becomes significantly worse for people at a point in which your boss's son is not even around to be able to say like, ah, uh, you know, 
like how how you're doing or whatever. Okay, next thing then, um, investments and action. And I think this is actually crucial because their side says, ah, if you have an endless stream of money coming in, then you're far more likely to lead a hedonistic lifestyle. However, I think that what they understate here is the desire for people to be able to create more forms of passive income and more forms of capitalistic outcomes. Like the truth is, if you have so much money, you have financial security for the rest of your life, buying 25 Chanel bags is not going to make a difference in that kind of wealth. But what does make a difference is your capacity, is the amount of money that you're likely to invest in different kinds of companies. If you don't have an additional stream of money, and if you are risk averse, as the other side suggests, that people are going to be, you aren't going to invest in new startup technologies because those require huge amounts of investment and require a long time and are extremely risky. You're going to invest in things like, for example, blue chip stocks. There are old forms of technology that don't move forward with the time, as opposed to being willing to risk it all on the next potential unicorn because that unicorn could potentially make the next generation of your family equally rich as well. For these reasons, we think we maximize outcomes. Unfortunately, the rich bastard that's kind of useless will have to work with you. We're very happy to oppose. I thank the Deputy Leader of Opposition for that speech and would like to next invite the government whip. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, hello, everyone. I believe this camera is tilted. Is it tilted? Oh, no, it's good. All right. Anyways, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Luigi, Professor of France. If you have any POIs, you can raise it in the chat. I want to chat for all of your POIs. All good. And uh, <clears throat> let's go. All right. All right, game. Starting my speech in three, two, one, and go. Opposition falls into what I would call the wealthy parent fallacy. That upon seeing your little Jacob graduate from the prestigious Trump University, eating popcorn, relaxing on a lazy boy seat, you tell him, son, it is time you learn how to run the company. Well, not, not the family conglomerate yet, that's a bit too soon, but maybe one of our other media companies that employ around 10,000 people. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that real lives should not be tested and should not be the training wheels of the rich. They are lives, not wheels. They are not hot wheels, but they are lives. There are two issues I'm going to focus on in this speech. Number one, what contribution do wealthy individuals provide through employment? And number two, how do we make a better world? Uh, there is someone that is unmuted. Dare I say, let me continue. First, what contribution do wealthy individuals provide through employment? At government side, we argued that wealthy individuals substantially crowd up capital in a fundamentally terrible way. So we, we gave any mechanisms from Prime Minister, maybe not so much in DPM because I don't really like the DPM. We talked about the over-concentration of salary. We talked about the working conditions and the worsening of such because of the lack of in interaction with many unions and the antagonistic nature that's also created between them. And we also talked about the different ways in which the, the, the way in which you uh, crowd up these employee benefits and the significant lack of skill that you provide to these workplaces. What's Dilo's response? Dilo's response is, well, no, no, no. The money, if they're doing nothing and they're just uh, pencil sharpening in the CEO position, then the money goes back to the shareholders and then it's going to be redistributed back anyways because they know it's unproductive. But that doesn't account for the fact that this person is a wealthy individual with guaranteed financial security, meaning that you're not giving the money to the rich kid because of the productivity that he's providing. You're giving it because of the network effects that many shareholders can provide with this, which is why this is something that multiplies. It becomes harder and harder to overturn, especially when they're already employed. And it, hard, it becomes harder and harder to change that culture because you're currying favors with the elite. What we said at PM is that this substantially changes as a culture within the workplace when they refuse to not participate or they do not participate at all, maybe because they, they find it too hassle, maybe they want to do another thing, they want to develop a hobby, learn guitar, or maybe they want to buy an island and drink some mojitos or whatever, or join a social uh, venture group and uh, interact with the poor in the world. All of these things are substantially less risky compared to being put in a CEO position where you can substantially decide the lives and the employment rights and the working conditions of many individuals as part of this company. That's why our impact is much larger. Our impact is more important. What is Ops' best response? Ops' best response is that they say, no, no, no. Because rich people control the economy, they'll control it on either side. So their argument from DLO is that they should be taught about the financial market so that they can avoid bad venture capital investments. I have three responses. Number one, or two responses, sorry. Number one, giving them this position does not give them more information on how the companies work. Because DLO says you can interact with the middle class. Who do you interact with from the middle class when you're a CEO position? You go to the boardroom meetings. 
You go to an executive meeting with other people. This does not mean you're interacting with the middle class. You're not understanding their plight or what goes on in a factory company. You're not understanding what happened to the to a union. And when they're unionizing, you're still going to have the same assumptions and stereotypes on these individuals. But now it's substantially worsened because you were given this position without the experience that was provided for you. That is why it is worse on their model. Secondly, incentives for bad venture capital, if they exist, right, are substantially reduced in our side. Again, go back to PM analysis. Uh, again, ignore DPM just a little bit now because I think PM was much cooler here. The surplus work that is provided in this method through employment on our side substantially is expounded upon when many individuals would want to invest in productive economies or protect the productive industries because now they have an incentive to do so given they don't have employment. So the response of DLO is, well, no, it's, uh, it's a marginal difference. Well, if it was a marginal difference, suddenly their side, their able to make productive investments when they work with a company, but on our side, because it's a marginal difference of employment, suddenly they won't. I think the symmetric uh, incentive applies. They're still able to get a good investment if they will invest in a company. Maybe their parents made that investment. Maybe their grandparents made that investment. Still good either way. Like if land is land. Real estate is real estate. That's still going to be good for the economy. I don't see why that is going to be de deteriorating as an unstable startup capital investment that's going to be hard for people in the ground. Let me go on. Be clear. These impacts to minorities, the labor market, and the economy are substantially the most important impacts in this debate, and that is why we win. Let's go on to respond to the other things. DLO says that we have to comprehend with the real world, right? That this house prefers world motion, the hypothetical, and we have to understand why would they not pursue employment? Why would they not likely do this? And they, they say they will avoid schools and all of these things. Well, there are many reasons why they would not want to do this in our world. We, we gave them a prime minister and DPM. And now this is where Miko's stuff comes in. We talked about why these individuals, for example, would want to uh, pursue other philanthropic activities, for example, to find meaning to replace the need for them to do work every single day. It may be good because they put a lot of money into humanitarian organizations and they just feel that they're contributing to the economy rather than feeling like they're product, pro pro producing something as part of the, the corporation by putting a policy or substantially changing one part of the company as well. So I don't know. Um, honestly, humanitarian organizations are putting money into philanthropic organizations. Sometimes it might do some net bad in some instances, but in the vast majority of cases, usually Bill Gates does good for the world. And I think that's perfectly fine, especially when we're talking about many things which are very easily solvable by rich, rich individuals that focus their uh, resources and time on that for nine to five every single day, like uh, malaria nets or whatever, which allow people to uh, improve their lives in those cases. Uh, let me do the worst case here. The worst case on our side is a hedonistic lifestyle. A hedonistic lifestyle, mojitos, islands, going to do other things in your life is substantially better than being put in a position of authority through an executive position or in a corporate position where you interact with other individuals. So even if you're hedonistic and you know you buy your Chanel, you buy your uh, luxury goods, all of these other things to be happy, you maybe you uh, have a special meeting with uh, Tony Stark and then uh, Iron Man and then you have fun to talk with these people. These are all things that do not substantially affect other poor communities or other people that are employed in other organization, whereas this is directly tied to your employment. It's directly tied to your employment and that is why it's substantially worse. Um, let me talk about one last thing. Uh, uh, yeah, so the, there's an incentive for you to invest in philanthropic activities because of the diminishing, diminishing marginal utility that DLO provides. DLO said, you know, you can't drink mojitos all the time. That, that is exactly the incentive as to why they would pursue other activities that might be good on our side. How do we build a better world? So at PM and DPM, we argued that the desire to work can be channeled into many other good things. DLO says they will avoid schools. And I think this is the best argument that was implicitly argued here. Again, it's very implicit. It's very, very small. This is the argument that they will not invest in universities and Ivy League schools. But remember, there are many reasons why you would still want to go to an Ivy League school, even if you don't go for employment, the prestige, the connections. Maybe you also want to meet other rich people and you also want to uh, allow yourself to build a network in the future. Then rich people will still invest in a trust fund because they're part of the alumni network and want Want to be prestigious and want to be rewarded by the public anyways so i don't see why that's bad but if there's a hobby and being in school you interact with middle class people there anyways you interact with a road scholar you interact with other people who are also part of this institution that's all good because it also allows us to do this without the substantial risk that comes from being an executive position for these reasons because we talk about family and we talk about jobs and capital i'm very proud to propose I thank the government whip for that speech, and I'd like to next invite the opposition whip.
um, opposition whip? Oh, sorry. I think you're facing some like internet internet connections. <laughs> like the dual laptop thing is really not working for us. Can you just no like give us a couple of seconds, please. Like honestly, super sorry. Yeah, it's alright. No worry. It happened. Okay. Uh yeah, P Y is in the chat. I'll try to take one of four or five, otherwise I can vocalize. Okay, starting my speech in three, two, one. Uh, proposition oh, assumes that ways of generating passive income like investment and freelance opportunities is the best thing for wealthy individuals because it kind of like quarantines them for the rest of society who's hardworking and deserving. Um, the problem with this is that they want to claim all the benefits of investment, like uplifting certain business and businesses and tech centers, um, which is good for the economy and middle classes, but somehow none of the perverse phenomena that's um, inherently tied to the generation of passive income, like exploiting, exploiting competition on financial markets that are built inherently on preying on global people who want to also invest. Somehow they're not beholden to any of that. Um, based on their own character tradition of rich people and their families as inherently elitist, rubbing their greedy little hands ready to exploit poor people, right? I have no idea why, why or how they're going to be so harmless just because they're not going to the workplace. Here's a comparative. On their side, individuals will still continue living um, sheltered lives among people who are in similar financial and social standings of themselves, but just earning money through passive income, right? Not really offering much else versus our side. Sure, maybe they take positions away from certain other people, maybe, who deserve it more, um, but they obviously are going to uh, be more uh, in contact with the economy and society at large, therefore know more about the world, and it's likely that there will be some people who contribute valuable work or even try to help others. No, we are not banking our case on the hopes that rich people will be good-hearted after being exposed to work or other people. The point is that um, even considering like what kind of job you want to be in and then actually experiencing work is valuable in and of itself for granting the ability to conceptualize the world better, to expand your social circle just a little bit more, maybe have a passion and understand how the economy works a little bit better as well just by virtue of being in work, right? The, de the detriment aside, often is that your ability to get these benefits more limited because you're likely to remain in your own circle already available to you by virtue of uh, by virtue of being born in a certain family and having gone to some prep school or something to clash in this debate Firstly, which side want to stimulate rich people more to be motivated to um, do useful things? Secondly, on which side are rich people going to be maybe a little bit nicer towards poor people? Uh, first thing, how do we get rich people to be useful? I think down the bench, we've already told you how to mitigate the propensity to be beholden to capitalist evils, right? By having them interact with all people in society who don't necessarily all come from the same background, who are exposed to how society works and functions, right? They're still asking, however, and what, why and how would they interact with the middle class? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen really revolutionary concept called social mobility. It's this thing where people who were poor or like middle class and were like fucked over by virtue of the birth lottery, they get educated, um, maybe through scholarships or whatever. Then they offer their talents to companies. And there's this whole culture now increasing of like liking diversity, liking success stories that are inspiring. And just in general, the increasing mobility of middle class and developing and developed nations. Um, so there are people who are even minorities who are now in higher positions of work. And even if they're not in CEOs, then they're actually still beholden to report to these executives and these rich people and interact with them. So there are problems for instance, they report the problems to people who are higher up and maybe these rich people, right? And uh, at that point, these rich people do have to care about these things because that's their work still, right? Um, and maybe they'll even like these people who are like the middle class who are now in the higher positions because their personalities are compatible or maybe like they play the same freaking video game or whatnot, right? So clearly there's more awareness and knowledge of how things work, how society works, how economies function on our side of the house at the point at which in this work structure, you are beholden to have to know about these things at the point at which you are still executive, right? It's still better than you being instantly in your circle of like little rich kid friends who like all want to go on a freaking private, private jet to Cabo or something all the time, right? They say then that jobs will be, uh, this will be bad for the job economy because you know more funding, higher salaries from middle class on their side of the house versus us where you only are pumping money into executive salaries. Okay, they don't respond 
to what Sherman says at all about this, right? Why the money won't go downwards, right? If the position is as fake as they say, why would it go back to middle class workers who don't have the power or social or political capital to be able to even be seen as viable for that meaningless position that they characterize, right? Just because the space becomes open doesn't explain why disenfranchised people are going to get the state, or, or, or disenfranchised people are going to be the ones who get these positions. That link is fundamentally missing. I don't think they actually uh, fill it up and with either, right? So I want to know again, the main benefit is that we're not guaranteeing that these middle class people are going to get these higher positions. The point is that through contact, right, through actually interact with, act, interacting with them, you force, you compel these richer kids to actually know what's going on and maybe care just a little bit, right? Okay, secondly then, this goes to explain why rich people are going to be maybe a little bit uh, better for poor people on our side. Let's be real. The white protestant male trust fund baby born from a politically powerful family, i.e. the Trumps of the world on both sides of the house, has many reasons to be fucked up and not give a shit about poor people. The question is, can work change that inherently exploited in nature of capitalism that they might be indoctrinated by since young, right? We already addressed this, right? On the contact theory, I again want to flag this out. We're not saying these rich people are going to be meeting like the abused labor in China who's digging up radioactive material for Apple phones. That's obviously insane. The fact is that they'll be interacting with a still more diverse group of people, like people who were lower classes in life, but through, again, social uh, mobility moved up, right? So I think meeting up with these people and hearing their ideas, hearing about their um, backgrounds, being able to communicate with them, or just being forced to communicate with them one-on-one -on -one, and form interpersonal relationships is so crucial because it introduces a, a drastically different worldview to the mind of a rich elite person who probably won't have the same chance to interact with an individual on that side of such an individual on that side of the house, right? Also, we'll be able to, I don't know, maybe even just see people struggling or protesting outside your work, hear about the grievances that the people have about uh, pe that people have about your company because you work for that company and you'll still be hearing more about why these uh, upset, upset exist as opposed to on the other side where you're just going to be removed from your reality. You have no reason to care about this unless you um, um, actually you just don't have any reason to care about it because Side where you'll at least be seeing it in the news when you go to work, right? Fine. Maybe if you're Trump's son, you don't care. But obviously, not all these people are going to be Trump's son, in which case, there is room for these individuals to become more aware that these problems exist in society and understand why they exist, even if um, so, because it maybe appeals to the human side just a bit, right? Especially if they form certain personal relationships in the workplace, right? Um, and I think even if it never, they, if they never end up caring, it's still better at the point at which you have other groups in society than seeing these rich people in high power career positions not do anything now that they're open up to, um, to criticism and scrutiny, right? Um, but before I move on to that, uh, is there a POI? Okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, right, so the point on scrutiny, right? I think this is something that inherently opens up more discourse about inequality in society, if need be, right? On the other side, I don't think you get this at the point at which individuals are insulated within your own circles and undeniably having lesser chance to interact with these lived realities of people on the ground, right? Given such uh, social scrutiny and social pressure that we, we see, already see on the status quo, even the biggest, most superficial rich people who clearly don't care about minorities or people obviously open up like philanthrop uh, philanthropic initiatives like charities. They create sponsorships and scholarships for disenfranch disenfranchised students or employees because at that point when they're working these things do matter to them and they know that these things do exist right first uh, versus on the other side where they don't have a chance to be exposed to these things right um and so because these, these are things that are important to like company image their own image reputability and power they've already situated themselves in the workplace where they are um beholden to these things that's why they will care as much right on the other side this does not manifest this uh, philanthropic initiative does not manifest because if you don't have the experience of having seen people like strike or talk about their experiences or having heard of them at all right there's no less reason or incentive to care about it because it's not at that point tied to anything real that you have in your life, right? Your company, your work, and your ability to, your ability to even see philanthropy as a good and meaningful thing is less on your side. So I don't think they actually characterize why people will even care about charity or philanthropy on their side of the house as opposed to our side, therefore, where we win because we proved to you why these people are more, firstly more motivated, have a passion, and secondly, have more propensity to see other people being uh, other people on the ground as real human beings who might be equals. For those reasons, very proud to oppose. the opposition whip for that speech and I'd like to next invite the opposition reply speaker. Hi, um, am I audible? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, starting my speech in three, two, one. I'm just going to start this debate with the intuition part because I think ultimately how this debate is going to go, it's going to depend on whether you buy the fact that this new world that we are creating is going to be a world that is substantially different from the one that we have right now. But I think that there are some things that we can draw from from this world that helps us understand what this new world is like. In status quo, we have rich kids um, who work really hard in school, uh, who do well. Um, obviously, they are like, you know, helped by their privilege, but some of them actually do work quite hard despite that. Um, going to jobs in companies that their families 
presumably have less of an affiliation to, they are not wholly owned by their companies and try to succeed there. Yes, it is annoying that they're able to get to further positions uh, because of their connections and because that they, come, they come from privilege. But these people exist right now. Let's contrast that to another group of people that we see in society right now um, as well. People who are rich, know that they are rich, don't ever go to university and can't be bothered because they know that they don't have to, can't really be bothered to find employment and just spend their entire day playing golf or just wasting their money uselessly. Or for example, or they do go to university because it's like prestigious or whatever, but then they just never actually do very well. They're the idiot who just says random shit in class because of class participation and stuff. The former is infinitely less annoying than the second. And I think that that's actually really important because what the side of the government wants is a world full of the second group of people who are an absolute waste of space that I think just makes the world significantly worse for everyone involved. The characterization we gave you was very clear. The world has a number of families and individuals who have a lot of capital and that capital is actually like like determines how life could be like for everyone else. A small fraction of that wealth could literally change the life of a person who's from the middle class. The question is how then do we allow for the percolation and circulation of that money to exist in society today? The first thing that we told you was, in their world, these interactions don't happen at all. Everyone is an individual that doesn't have the desire to have a separate identity from the wealth that they have. They don't want to be in occupations. They don't really go to universities. And even when they do, they feel no reason to network and to get, you know, buy in from other people or to be popular among individuals that are not as rich as them. Working is seen as an exclusively middle class and poor people thing to do because no one that is rich is working. No one that is rich will ever have to find employment and you will never have to think twice about you know when you talk to someone and a person says oh I work a nine to five whether or not they're any they have any relationship to you because they don't working is a uniquely different and eye-opening experience that individuals go through that allow for them to be able to interact with one another on a basis that is significantly more level and equal they um straw man this and say ah but you know the CEO never actually knows what the people on the ground are necessarily doing they don't know what it's like yeah okay I can agree with that like some CEOs have no idea what happens on the ground, especially if your company is massive. But just because you're a rich kid doesn't mean you become a CEO immediately. Even as an executive, you're in a managerial position in which you have a team that you have to overlook. If you're a person who started out as a consultant, which is a high-ranking, a high-paying job, but ultimately one that you know many rich kids start out in because they want the prestige of being able to climb upwards, then you will interact with people who are in the middle class. You will interact with individuals who are able to garner social mobility sufficiently to put them in the positions that allow them to access the occupation in the first place, which means that you just have a significantly better understanding of what people on the ground are like. They are much more human to you as an individual. So the other side say, ah, but the rich people now can spend all the free time that they say from not being an executive that does jack shit to do philanthropic activities instead. But there's a missing link here, right? If you don't care about the middle class, if you just see them as a completely separate species to you with no interaction or similarity in your day-to-day -day life, whether it is studying or working, why would you ever want to be philanthropic? What meaning does it really give you if you don't really care for these people anyway? So I think for those reasons, obviously it's not perfect, but it's better to have some interaction than none, which is what happens on their side of the house. The next things that we wanted to tell you about were just things about investment and the like. I don't think we got a lot of like responses from this. They just said that, oh, you will want to grow your money um, and therefore you would still invest. We told you if you didn't understand what happened on the ground, if you weren't in a position of like understanding how a company functions, how the middle class functions, and if you weren't in a position where you had a backup salary to be able to invest in riskier startups, then those kinds of circulations of wealth wouldn't happen. We're happy to oppose. I thank the opposition reply speaker for that speech. And to close the debate, I'd like to invite the government reply speaker. Hello. My audio. Um, it's a bit soft. Can you try again? Okay. Uh, sorry. Is, is this better? Yeah, a bit better. Thank right, you. Great. Give me one moment. I'll start my speech in three, two, one. So I've never been attacked by a partner before, but I'll agree and say the PM speech was brilliant and has a lot of things still standing. There are two things I'll do. First is a way any impact you believe definitely from both sides. And second is a way the probability of creating an elite class that is likely to be more understanding and sympathetic. One, let's look at Op's biggest harm. The rich people are isolated and uninformed because they don't go to university, they don't care about other people. 
first thing I want to note about that is that this in and of itself is a much worse harm than allowing them to take power because what we said is there's a benefit to the people that are likely to take over. I'll explain that in a bit. But note that when they can just put their money somewhere, they don't have decisions over how that money is spent if it's invested in a company. They don't make corporate decisions in another company. And therefore, the decision-making body is no longer the wealthy and the elite. And therefore, even if they are bad people, they have little power to actually enact that bad people, like you know, being awful. So even if rich people are more likely to be like evil on our side, they have significantly less power. And this is the contradiction in their case, right? If they cannot be bothered to go to school, to learn anything, and they just want to play golf all day, it's also unclear whether they would be at all bothered to meddle in politics, to try and do any evil thing. And therefore, they might be more uninformed. I don't really care. I don't know what they'll do about with that. There were three positive benefits. We explained, though, that I don't think they really respond to. One, you're probably going to get someone who is more meritocratically determined as competent. And what we said about that is there are many important decisions that have to be made by someone that is not going to mess up, that is not, you know, the training wheels, as Luigi says. I'm going to back him up as a partner of some little kid that needs to be able to get better as an executive. But secondly, it's obviously a matter of scale, right? We're not saying minorities are going to take every single executive position. But what we are saying is that the demographic of people with generational wealth is far less representative than the demographic of everyday individuals or middle class, upper middle class people that are just trying to work hard, which is more likely to represent a significant number of groups and therefore we are more likely to attain that benefit. Thirdly, we said having connections is bad because it creates a, a conflict of interest when you are trying to manage a business but at the same time can potentially lobby a government or also it's just bad in terms of economic decisions because someone might be just doing a favor because they know you're a powerful person's son. Someone might be giving you a contract because they know you and grew up with you because all the rich kids grew up together and therefore they can make decisions together. These are all things that are net negatives and even if ri rich people were awful we take them out of the equation and therefore it is a better world. Moreover, our argument on the wealth gap, which is that if they're gonna do all the awful things they say that investment won't make as much money or they're going to spend it on like millions of hedonistic behaviors, then at the very least over time, the undue influence that they have over the rest of the world is going to decrease. We create a more egalitarian world, even if that wealth was not going to be productively used, we still say that at the very least they have less undue influence on the rest of the society. Secondly, where do you create better conditions? So I want to note that this context theory argument, one, insofar as they significantly limit the context, is also going to significantly limit its impact. I.e., if your everyday interactions are mostly with people in boardrooms, with shareholders, with the people around you, your family, it's unclear as to how sympathetic you're going to be, especially because the people that are most likely to need the labor rights they claim are going to come from the people they interact with the most because they say they don't interact with them. But secondly, is that we said this contact could be negative. One, because there's an antagonistic relationship. If you have a set number of revenue as a company and you have to divide salary, I'm going to boost my CEO salary. And I'm, no way I'm going to give to minimum wage workers. I'll keep them at minimum wage. But secondly, is that you can see them as potentially destructive to your company, that they're unionizing again. They try to get more benefits again and therefore are unlikely to be positive interactions and therefore are not likely to receive the benefits of increasing labor rights for this group of people. What was the comparative we showed you? Not only did we explain they're more likely to come from this privileged background that is more likely to come into contact with them independent of the work that they do. But secondly, is that if you can't rely that your daddy's son, you can't rely on simply being able to have credentials from some big name school, you have to curry favor with the company that is far more likely to integrate the interests of other employees, that is far more likely to ensure that your self-interest in being able to rise the ranks of the company is tied into ensuring the rest of the company benefits if you provide those rights, rather than just being born in the right place at the right time to the right people. I am very proud to propose.